everyone. Uh, today, we are joined by a number of very good speakers and experts, and our panel is going to be on how FEAR can help better integrate cyber risk with ERM. So let me uh, ask everyone to start uh, by just a quick introduction. Uh, my name is James Lamb. I will be your moderator. I am the president of James Lamb & Associates. And I also serve on um, a number of private and um, public company boards. Greg? Yes, thanks for having me, James. My name is Greg Montana, and I'm the Chief Risk Officer of FIS. Glad to be here. Uh, Keith? Hello, everybody. My name is Keith Weinbaum. I'm an Enterprise Risk Architect with Quicken Loans. It's great to be here. Uh, Paul? Hi, also a pleasure to be here. My name is Paul Sobel and uh, I've actually retired from the rat race in, in January. Uh, so my current role is chairman of the Committee of Sponsoring Organization of the Treadway Commissions, commonly known as COSO. And last but not least, Chris. I'm Christopher Porter and I'm the Senior Vice President and Chief Information Security Officer for Fannie Mae. Great. Okay, so let me just start by um, saying how important this topic is in terms of integrating cyber risk with enterprise risk management. As many of you know, just in the last few uh, months, we've seen guidelines from NIST, the SEC, COSO, and the NACD in terms of the importance of integrating cybersecurity and ERM, and specifically the quantification of cyber risk and risk appetite. So today in our panel, I'm going to um, use a framework, uh, an ERM framework, to guide and organize our uh, discussion. So the framework has four key components. One is governance structure and policy. How do we organize ourselves in terms of who, who makes what decisions? How do we set policies like risk appetite? The second component is risk assessment and quantification. How do we make more informed decisions, X and T? The third question is going to relate to risk management. How do we optimize the shape of our risk uh, profile in terms of risk acceptance, pricing, capital allocation, or risk transfer? And then finally, uh, dashboard reporting and monitoring. How do we know we are accomplishing what we need and that our risk exposures are within our risk appetite and, and enhance um, transparency for the management and the board of the company. So uh, Greg, why don't I start with you? Uh, what is the governance structure for cybersecurity and enterprise risk management at FIS? And also if uh, risk appetite is clearly defined. Thank you for the questions, James. At FIS, we have organized our risk management framework into three lines of defense model. Uh, all business units are part of the first line of defense, so really everyone at the company who isn't in risk and internal audit. And the first line of defense owns all the risk. They're really accountable for managing risk for their business units. I lead the second line of defense, which is risk, information, security, and compliance. And the third line of defense is our partners in the company and internal audit. So we first off are organized by this three lines of defense model. The risk organization is compromised, is, I'm sorry, is, is comprised of organizations that cover our top risks. And as you can see from the slide, we have our chief security officer, we have our chief compliance and customer advocacy officer who deals with all of our consumer regulations and focuses on not only our clients, which are financial institutions and retailers and capital markets firms, but also the end consumers of those services of our clients. We have an enterprise risk executive, which is essentially the leader who brings the whole program together for all the businesses. And we have business unit risk officers akin to 
a financial firm that might have a chief risk officer for a wealth division or a mm -hmm. consumer banking division. We have a corporate affairs and external uh, affairs executive, and he's focused on, on really policy. So we have a number of leaders who focus on regulations and policy. Andrew on this uh, org chart focuses on public policy. So he works with um, governments around the world to help us have a voice and our clients on their behalf have a voice in policy making in all the jurisdictions that we work in. Sue Dillon's our regulatory relations executive because we're examined by the federal banking agencies, both obviously at the federal and state level in the US and internationally uh, regulators around the world in which we do business. And finally, we have a chief risk, uh, credit risk officer who focuses on the credit risk that we deal with as a merchant acquiring business. So essentially we're organized around our top risks and I'll go into a little more detail uh, in a moment on that. Um, it includes our structure then feeds into really the organizational and management governance structure that you were asking about. So they all focus on those top risks and our governance structure follows that in which our executive risk management committee, we call it our executive risk management and technology committee, which really puts a focus uh, on a lot of our technology offerings, offerings as a technology service provider. So we cover all risk disciplines in this management committee and governance and policy and reporting to management at the executive level is presented quarterly at that executive risk and technology committee. And then it flows up to our board. So we have two committees of the board in which the executive committee flows that information and those decisions up to the board level for their uh, oversight. That's the risk committee and technology committee, and then there's the audit committee of the board. And we bifurcate our, a number of our risk categories, such as cybersecurity and operational risk, up into the risk and technology committee, and then compliance and regulatory flows up into the audit committee of the board. At each of the levels, we cover off on each of those organizations and those leaders present at those management and board committees with me. And we have top five, top five risks that we focus on. So just to finish up the answer to your question, mm -hmm. we have five top risks that we cover. So the strategic risks, which are risks associated directly with achieving our business strategy, including human capital, M&A, market fluctuations, that's championed by our CEO. So each of the different risk categories have an executive champion. So strategic risk is my boss, the chairman, president and CEO. Financial loss and fraud risk is the second major risk. And those are risks related to moving uh, or processing, recording, monetary transactions and maintaining the financial health of our company. The CFO is the champion of that. Process and execution risk is the third of the five risks. And those are risks associated with delivering products and services for our clients, including development of those products, resiliency and third party relationships. That's championed by our CIO and head of technology. Um, so outside of my boss being the strategic risk champion for that top risk, the rest of these are either my peers or direct reports. Mm. The fourth category, regulatory and compliance risks are related to maintaining satisfactory reviews and ratings with our global regulatory authorities, maintaining our adherence with laws and other requirements. That's our chief compliance and customer advocacy officer. And then what I often refer to as our Uber risk is information security risk. Mm -hmm. And those are risks associated with ensuring the protection of sensitive information, cyber, physical, and insider threats. So those round out our top five, and mm -hmm. that's led by our chief information security officer who reports to me. James, I often get the question, why don't I have myself as a champion of any of those risks? And it's because I created all those top five risks and the uh, risk appetite statements around them and decided not to put myself accountable for anything. <laughs> all, all, all kidding aside, uh, I had the pen, but I really feel like those champions are the ones who are really responsible. So we wind up, as a result of this governance structure and having risk appetite statements, I feel like there's ownership across the company and my peers and my boss are really the champions for those risks. And then uh, just to finalize the answer around the governance piece, for all these top risks, uh, these executive champions along with my team, we're obviously going through at the executive level and then up to the board. We're going through the top risks every quarter, our emerging risks, and then we're looking at performance uh, metrics 
and risk appetite statements that tie to those with our KRIs and KPIs. Mm -hmm. And of course, with FAIR that we're starting to look at and begin to implement at FIS, we're really trying to measure it in a way that's quantifiable for everybody at the company. So thanks for those questions. Hopefully that helps. That's great. That's great. Hey, Paul, do you have anything to add to um, this um, notion of uh, corporate governance and, and uh, policy? Yeah, so um, you know, it's interesting when I looked at the framework that you put up, James, uh, it, it really aligns quite closely with uh, COSO's uh, 2017 updated risk management framework. Um, and it aligns in particular with the governance and culture uh, component that we have. And uh, one of the principles in that component is specifically about establishing operating structures. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I think Greg did a splendid job of describing you know, what they do at FIS and, and really covered it very, uh, I think, comprehensively. Uh, the one thing I would add is uh, back in December, COSO issued some guidance relating to managing cyber risk in a digital age. And yeah. what we did with that guidance is we took the five components of ERM and then customized them to how do you, you know, kind of frame them up when you're trying to manage cyber risk. And so while it didn't talk too much about structures, it did uh, reference uh, NIST a little bit and, and did talk about the importance of making sure that your governance structures, which is really about oversight and, and strategy, specifically has a role in overseeing cyber risk, because cyber risk is one of the most prominent risks that really every company faces. And uh, that's not going away in the near future. It'd likely get worse before it gets better. So I, I think the key here is, is that while you know, governance structure and policies make sense from a general standpoint, they can and should be customized to specifically address cyber risk to make sure that it all operates more seamlessly. Thank you. Thank you, Greg and Paul. That's uh, very helpful. Let me uh, turn to Keith next on risk assessment and quantification. So at Cooking Loans, what frameworks, frameworks do you use for ERM and Cypher? And, and how do you integrate those two? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I mean, really at Quicken Loans, we're, we're all in on FAIR in terms of the whole stack uh, that, you, that you just mentioned. And we really have been for, for nearly a decade. Uh, and I can, I can walk through a quick example here, a quick high-level example, which is our confidentiality risk model. So clearly within the cyber risk scope of things, uh, um, from a risk identification standpoint, we started from identifying all the different data repositories, all the different data connections that contain significant amounts of sensitive information. And we modeled all of our scenarios on how a breach could occur to those various repositories. And in order to do that, we leverage something that's taught in the advanced fair training, which is called the scoping triangle, which includes looking at threats, uh, assets, and then the negative effects that those threats can have on those assets. And all of these scenarios are, are chained together. So if we start at the end loss event scenario, where basically where, where the loss occurs, where you know, hypothetically one of these data repositories would be breached, well, then we start you know, we, we create all the scenarios for that. And then we went ahead and we worked backwards from that. And we created scenarios that represent every vector that a malicious actor could possibly take, uh, you know, across our network in order to eventually arrive at, at that final destination. Uh, and, and all of these chained together scenarios, they're, they're all mathematically related together. It's all one big web of scenarios. And, and then we took and we modeled out for each of those scenarios, we used the FAIR taxonomy, uh, that you know, a lot of people know now, and we and we modeled out all the risk factors, the underlying risk factors, which of course we then collect the quantitative calibrated estimates for. I would say, all in all, we probably have for that one confidentiality risk model, it comprises of over 200 scenarios. Uh, that, again, that are all chained together, they're all linked together, and with at least twice as many risk factors tied to that. So it's, it's definitely a lot of work there. And what I have noticed is that it is similar to, to some other frameworks, such as NIST, the risk model that's mentioned in the NIST, uh, you know, guidelines there. Uh, it's very similar. It has very similar components, of course. And, and ultimately, we're doing it at this granular level to help us pinpoint the most valuable control improvement opportunities, which, you know, in an organization our size, we've got thousands of controls you know, across the board from a cyber risk perspective. So, you know, where are those opportunities to best improve controls? 
uh, especially if and when our aggregate risk, because we can aggregate all these 200 plus scenarios all into a single uh, set of results, uh, if that aggregate risk is above our company's risk appetite, then it makes it much easier to find, all right, where can we really improve? Uh, when it comes to the, the ERM part of the equation here, uh, cyber risk is fully integrated with, with enterprise risk management here. Uh, luckily, enterprise risk management here leverages FAIR, uh, or something close to it, for at least all operational related uh, scenarios and, and, and many others uh, in addition to that. And essentially, it's just looking at the probable frequency and the probable magnitude of future loss, right? So all of the outputs of all these scenarios, whether it's cyber risk or, or other operational risk scenarios, they're all communicated in terms of our future loss exposure, loss to both capital and to earnings. Uh, and, and because we're leveraging the same exact methodology across the board, we're able to truly compare apples to apples so that we can prioritize our company's limited resources in making sure that we're truly focused on reducing the right risks at the right time. Got it. What, what about something uh, uh, like strategic risk? Do you use the same framework or do you have a, a separate framework for that? Yeah, we're not, yeah, we don't use uh, FAIR for the uh, strategic risk part. Uh, that's something that we're, 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 we're getting better at uh, for the strategic risk, but yeah, we don't use FAIR for that. Yeah, but, but for operational and cyber, having an integrated framework helps. Absolutely. Hey, uh, Chris, do you have anything to add um, to what, what Keith has said? Yeah, certainly. So, uh, in my, so in my organization, I, I not only own the information security program, at, but also the first line risk um, organization as well. So I, I get to be first line risk for both technology, resiliency, operational risks as well. You know, for cyber risk in particular, we, we are also leveraging FAIR. And mm -hmm. we, we go through a lot of the same exercises that Keith just described to kind of get our risk registry. What are the most important things that we need to be worried about? A lot of it starts with the business, understanding what they're most worried about, uh, starts with the data. Uh, what are the most in, important pieces of data that we have to keep up and running? And being critical infrastructure also um, has a lot to do with it because there's more systemic risks that we have to think about as well. And, and, and so we leverage FAIR as the means of uh, capturing and quantifying that cyber risk at the first line for, cy for cyber risk in particular. And I think that we'll be able to do, use the same model to look at other operational risks as well over yeah. time. Um, other frameworks that we use are going to be just like a lot of your organizations. Uh, NIST, COBIT uh, for a lot of our SOX and IT controls, FedRAMP, CIS CSI Top 20, you know, um, or I guess it's CIS Top 20. Uh, you know, that just helps us understand what controls we have in our environment so that we can evaluate effectiveness and control strength and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, we then align that with our enterprise risk program. So we fold up uh, towards in the second line area, the, the operational risk um, umbrella. Um, and so cyber fits in that. And so we, the, the enterprise risk program has other methods. It's more qual qualitative in nature. Um, but they have their RCSAs that we work on, our RCM programs that we build up. So that's risk and control self-assessments that we do, risk and control matrices that are part of the second line program. Mm -hmm. and, and really right now, it's, it's a little bit of a kind of a, a conversion job that we're doing. We're, we're almost ETLing our uh, cyber risk quantification and, um, from the first line to the more qualitative method at the second line. Um, and it's been challenging, uh, to, to be honest. I mean, it's, it, it's, not, it's not always an easy thing to do. Um, but the, the second line, um, they are using COSO um, as their framework. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we've had challenges in the past. Um, like some of it's just nomenclature, like looking at internal fraud and external fraud as a, as a means. Well, when, when people in my organization think of internal fraud and external fraud, they immediately go to the fraud team, um, mortgage fraud in particular. They're right. not thinking cyber fraud or, or cyber incidents. Um, um, <laughs> so I, as soon as I started speaking, of course, my, my son go came on. in here. Always um, happens. Yeah. Yep. Um, hey, can you leave out of here, buddy? Um, thanks, pal. Um, so the... You know, so internal and external fraud is, is, is very, uh, you know, trying to make sure that we have the right sort of understanding of the nomenclature, I think is super important. Um, and then, you know, this, this kind of folds up into um, 
looking at risk appetite statements, and I, I, I heard heard that comment earlier um, on you know what is the appetite based on these scenarios? What what kinds of things is the company willing to have or not willing to have for that matter? Um, and how does that fit? You know, the James, I know you and I have had lots of discussions in the past around you know the how can cyber risk within the operational risk framework umbrella you know how can that fit into the capital frameworks of companies so that it's much easier to begin thinking about the uh, risk appetites and it's not as fuzzy math um, as as uh, as as some consultants um, I've heard in the past like to say um, around you know calculating a risk appetite for cyber risk at the board level using financial terms Right. Um, and and so I think it's important um, that we you know begin research in that that area. Like, how does it fit into an economic capital framework uh, for a company, um, and 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 how they manage risk? Um, what are the thresholds that they're looking at? So I think there's a lot of work to do. We've got a really good partnership with our enterprise risk team. Um, I see them heading in the direction of quantitative risk, but we're just not there that yet as a as an organization. Yeah. Well, it sounds like Keith has the benefit of having uh, one consistent framework uh, that he uses for Cypher and, and, and EOM. Whereas with uh, you, Chris, you, you have a FAIR framework and, and the COSO framework, but you use uh, kind of integrating tools like a risk appetite statement and metrics and RCSA to kind of connect it to. That's right. Okay, uh, the next question is probably a very important question, which is risk, risk management. And I'll turn that um, to Paul in the sense that, one, I always thought COSO did a great job in connecting risk management to business objectives. So how do you see companies integrate business and risk management decisions um, relative to their objectives, their pricing, capital, and, and other um, decisions yeah that's a that's a really important question i think and and you know frankly gets uh, to a great extent to why coso called the updated framework integrating with strategy and performance because risk management is not something you bolt on it's really an integral part of everything that's done day in and day out in fact uh, you know some kind of say how do you know when risk management's really working Mm -hmm. And my response to that is when business people are making better decisions more of the time. I mean, you're never going to make the perfect decision all of the time, but you're making better decisions. And, and so I think the key there is, as you indicated, James, is to make sure all that's integrated. It starts with making sure risk management is integrated all the way in the strategy and objective setting stage. Um, you have to consider risk, uh, the impact on the organization, the you know, potential unintended consequences, et cetera. And having that understanding can help make better decisions. Uh, you know, Keith and, and Chris both talked a little bit about having good ways to quantify risk. That works better in some industries than others. But that's really an important part of risk management because that helps you then make those risk pricing and capital allocation decisions. You feel more confident uh, that uh, you, you've really got your arms around you know, what the potential outcomes and the range of outcomes of that risk can be. And you know, then finally, I think it's, uh, it's also relevant in terms of uh, you know, not every risk decision is about reducing risk. It's about you know, ultimately an organization is successful when they achieve their business objectives and their mission and, and vision, et cetera. So I think you know, having good data and having everything integrated helps you make the sorts of decisions that will ensure you can be successful more of the time and that you implement the, you know, the right risk responses. Sometimes a risk transfer makes the most sense. Uh, sometimes you may decide you just want to avoid a risk completely. And often there are opportunities to actually pursue more risk. So without having it all integrated, it will be difficult to come up with the optimal risk response. Yeah, I think uh, we did. You know, Paul, I really like what you said around um, that risk is helping to make better decisions. I think that's spot on. I, I like to to say that um, often people refer, you know, to risk as the opposite of convenience that we cause, you know, a lot more steps and a lot more right. controls. Um, I like to think of it as, you know, um, you measure twice and cut once. So if you're involved early on, you can design a process that isn't going to have any it's going to prevent stops and starts. It's going to prevent and, you know, 
contemplate what could go wrong so that you can move faster. Um, no one, no one wants a sports car with a, you know, 500 horsepower engine without good brakes. Yeah, so you need that, to be able right. to enter the turn and hit the brake a little bit so that when you exit, you can even speed up faster. And I think um, that's the way I would describe what you're saying is that if risk is working well with the business, the business is the driver, uh, but we have the really good brakes um, that we can help them modulate and control their, their sports car so they can win the race. Yeah, I think it was Mary Andretti who famously made that quote that uh, I have good brakes to allow me to go faster, which that's sounds right. counterintuitive, but that's exactly what good risk management is. Good risk management allows you to be more aggressive and make more positive uh, risk uh, you know, pursuit decisions. That's absolutely right. And the sooner they get you involved, the businesses, the more you can add that value to the process so you can de-risk it and let them, let them run. Yep, exactly. The next question I'll turn to Chris um, relative to reporting and monitoring. Uh, how do you report on cyber risk to executive management and the board? And what are your top two or three cyber risk metrics? So yeah, we, we present our cyber metrics uh, to the board um, every other month, um, which is essentially, you know, we meet every other month, but there's there's practically board meetings every single month of the year, at least in my experience um, here at, um, at Fannie Mae. You know, I think one of the struggles with, with metrics in particular and cyber risk metrics, um, and I've been working on this problem literally for years, going back to my time working on the Verizon data breach report and even Andrew Jayqueef's, uh security metrics book from, you know, which I think was a phenomenal book back in the early um, 2000s is you know, what are the right metrics to capture for, for cyber risk? So what I'll talk about is a little bit around how I think is the right way to do it. But in my experience, everybody does it differently and there's no standardized way of doing this. So what we've tried to do um, and what has been a struggle is trying to figure out which are leading and lagging at indicators of risk. And so what we've tried to do is like based on our risk registry, we go through and look at each of those different types of risks. Like what are the most important risks, uh, cyber risk for the company? You know, it could be ransomware, data breach, um, and some other type of outage. And then what are the things that would indicate to you that you might have a problem? So when I think of ransomware, for instance, I'm, I'm developing metrics that are related to Windows patching. I mean, most ransomware is spreading around, uh, first it comes in via phishing. So I want metrics around my, my phishing. Um, and then I want metrics um, around Windows patching because that's how it works typically within an organization. And so those are the kinds of metrics that we're developing and, and, and presenting out. Um, but then there's gonna be other things that are a little bit more lagging indicators. Like uh, we want to make sure that the board knows how many cyber incidents that we have um, every, every month um, and, and quarterly. And, and, and so we're, we're presenting to them, you know, what's the number of extreme or major, you know, cybersecurity incidents that we have. Um, and then there's other more hygiene kinds of things that we want to understand, like unencrypted social security numbers or NPI or PII elements within the organization. Um, what are the number of, um, you know, endpoints that don't have all of the right endpoint security tools on it in the organization? Um, and, and, and so it's, it's really tying those specific types of metrics directly back to the risks um, so that we're showing one, you know, how are we managing the risk? Um, because those, those metrics should give us some indication of whether we're managing it well or not managing it well. And then being able to see those trends, how they work over time. Thank you, Chris. Keith, do you have anything to add on uh, risk reporting and monitoring? So yeah, this is a great question. And from our standpoint at, at Quicken Loans, uh, we, we meet uh, from an enterprise risk management standpoint, we meet every month with our executives, most of the executives. We have a, a monthly meeting there. Cyber risk results are included in monthly reporting in that meeting, but they're typically only discussed more formally on a quarterly basis. Uh, elements of that sort of reporting includes things like, obviously our aggregate risk exposure, Right, tying all that, all the scenarios together into one bubble up view of, of how much future loss we're exposed to. Uh, past trends in that exposure, 
as well as uh, important remediation efforts that are currently going on. What is the status of those? Are any lagging behind? Uh, and ultimately, how much less risk are we going to have as a result of each of those remediation efforts being completed? And that helps you know, drive the, the prioritization of those remediation efforts. Uh, from a metric standpoint, uh, we too, like, like Chris mentioned, we, we look at leading and lagging indicators. And uh, it's really driven based off of our, our model of, of what are those most important indicators. Uh, for example, fishing is, is, a, is a huge indicator there. You know, we, we do internal fishing campaigns uh, um, from kind of a, a leading indicator perspective. Same thing, uh, you know, leading indicator would be our vulnerability management related uh, metrics. Uh, um, we'll show some metrics around malware as well as, uh, you know, some, some incidents from time to time. But uh, those are, you know, kind of our, some examples of our top cyber risk metrics. Thank you, everyone. I thought that was a wonderful discussion. Uh, let me uh, ask everyone to conclude by um, summarizing one key takeaway uh, from the session today. And thank you, James. I really enjoyed every comment that was made, but I, I think two stood out for me. I think I really enjoyed hearing um, how Keith has utilized scenario analysis, leveraging the FAIR model, you know, to identify opportunities for making thoughtful decisions, such as investment in control deployments. And I also really enjoyed Paul's comments, the notion that risk is here to help the business make good decisions. So I thought the panelists did great. It's uh, been an honor to be a part of this. Uh, you know, thanks for the kind words, Greg. Uh, you know, from from my standpoint, uh, the the whole notion of integrating risk management with really everything else uh, that, that's done in an organization, but particularly integrating with strategy setting and and performance is key. And I I liked what I heard about uh, you know some of the tools that can be used, whether you're following a framework like NIST or uh, the, the the James Lamb framework now, which is probably going to become pretty famous. Uh, you know, it's important to make sure that gets integrated. I think it's also important to make sure that you have the right tools, whether it's FAIR or something else, so that you can do the quantification that then ultimately helps you make better risk decisions and better business decisions. This has been great. I, I, I enjoy this panel a, a, a tremendous amount. It's been great to hear all of these. It, it, it's, it's been great to, to see how much as an industry um, or collected industries, how much we're maturing in this space and getting better all the time. And, and yeah, we, we don't have it all figured out yet. Uh, but I mean, from what we just heard today, uh, it sounds like we're, we're absolutely figuring things out. Some of us have figured things out a little bit more than others. I know that we definitely have room to grow on, on the Quicken Loan side, and it's extremely excited. I, I think, you know, one of those areas uh, that we look forward to is how do we get this, this amazing decision-making capability in a more real-time fashion? Right? How do we provide that in a much more real-time fashion to our decision makers? Uh, not exactly to the second, but, but you know, much more closer to when they need to make that decision. And what we found is that to truly have that integrated risk management framework uh, or that infrastructure in place of centralizing all of our policies, procedures, controls, all of our testing tied to that and the results, all of the issues tied to that stuff, you know, all of the, you know, interesting risk landscape related metrics all coming in, all tied to these scenarios so that it's easy to see anytime that there's a change, let's update an estimate, let's get that information out to somebody so that they can go ahead and continue making a well-informed decision. And, and thank you all to everyone on the panel. I, I've really enjoyed our conversation today. You know, I think one of the key takeaways that I've, that I've got from this is just how important it is to have alignment um, and it seems like some of the organizations here have really strong alignment, um, really good collaboration with uh, their second lines uh, within their organization. You know, I, I think that that's probably one of the most important things that uh, you could do. I mean, at the end of the day, um, the lines of defense within an organization are there to protect the company, right? And um, just like when you're uh, thinking about it in terms of a football you know, the first line being the defensive line and uh, the second line being the linebackers and the, the audit team being the safety. I mean, you're, you're trying to present bad guys from getting touchdowns um, and all are having to work together to protect the company. And ha anytime you're out of alignment, um, there's a lot of pain um, and a lot of losing, unfortunately. <laughs> and so I, I think it's, uh, it, it's really good to see that, uh, that this is a direction that a lot of companies are going in. 
Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, I thought that was a, a wonderful discussion. Um, I think we, we all agree that the integration of cyber risk and enterprise risk management is, is very important. Uh, the, the guidelines and standards have been set. Uh, different companies may take different approaches to it. Uh, it may be a work in process, but it is a go and, it, uh, and an objective for many companies. Uh, so thank you uh, for your time.